to begin to the book of Acts, and uh, maybe more than most Sunday mornings, we're going to turn to several passages this morning. I want to encourage you to follow along if you have your Bible, and uh, if not, or if you're not familiar with where the books are, just uh, I will read each and every one of these passages. Uh, but this is a topic the Lord has uh, laid on my heart again, and I, I guess I probably visit this once or twice a year. And uh, the reason I revisit it, one, it's, a, it's an important part of uh, the Christian's life. The fact is this, if you don't know for sure that you are saved, how in the world are you going to help anybody else know that they're saved? You know, if you, if you have your own doubts about where you're going to spend eternity, heaven or hell, how are you going to help anyone else? Uh, we're coming up to a spring campaign, and our, our goal is to obey the Lord and to get folks to the, God, to the Lord, uh, to tell them the gospel so folks can be saved. But this is something that needs to be nailed down in every single heart and soul and mind here this morning, and that is this. The title of the message is this, The Eternal Security of the Believer. The Eternal Security of the Believer in Jesus Christ. The other reason this is so... Uh, I'm going to go to this mic, guys. I don't see a green light. I'm going to go to this one, I guess. Okay. All right, I'm going to stay right here the whole time. Okay. So uh, the reason this is so heavy on my heart is this, that the most popular kind of church in our region teaches. Now, they may not say it in this, this direct of a term, but they teach that you can lose your salvation. Now, folks, I'm just going to tell you, I'll just cut to the chase right now. You should never go to a church, ever, that teaches you you can lose your salvation. Um, I, I've heard people, I, I've heard from that church, <laughs> a pastor say, well, let me say it this way. It's very difficult, but not impossible to lose your salvation. Folks, let me say this. If your salvation depends on your effort or my effort, we're all in trouble. Uh, if your salvation at all depends on you keeping yourself or you remaining faithful, you're in trouble. Because let, let me ask you this. How much sin does it take for you to no longer be faithful? How much? Well, one sin. And you're not faithful. <laughs> And let me remind you, we're not talking about some good old boy down the street. We're talking about a holy, holy, holy God who his, his demands are far greater than any man's demands on sin and righteousness and holiness. I mean, he knows your very thoughts. He knows every word. He knows your motives. He knows your actions. He knows all, everything about all of us. And for a man to think that he could possibly impress a holy God is just really a fool's errand. It really is. Because, folks, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so for somebody to think they can keep their salvation or even earn their salvation a little bit is to think that God is going to accept your righteousness uh, as payment for your sin. And folks, what I want to say again very clearly is this, that if your salvation depends on you at all, then, then you are lost. If it depends on me at all, I am lost. The good news is our salvation completely depends on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It completely depends on the goodness of Jesus Christ, the holiness of Jesus Christ, and the imputed righteousness. That's a Bible word. Don't take it out of the Bible. It belongs there. What does it mean? It means that God takes Jesus' righteousness and he puts it on your account. And when he was on the cross, he took our sins and he put that on Jesus' account. And so the only way to get to heaven is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's, uh, the Bible uses a term, and we're going to see this over and over and over this morning, that you have to be in Christ to be saved. What does that mean? Again, it means simply that you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to begin here in Acts 16. The Bible's very simple. Do you think if God wanted us to be in heaven, do you think God wants us in heaven? He does. He wants us in heaven. Do you think then that he's going to make the instructions as simple as possible? Well, he is. He's going to make it simple. 
You know, we do our best when we invite a guest to come to church. We do our best to give them a map, to give them directions. Why? We want them here. We want you here. Well, God wants us in heaven. So he did not make it as difficult as man has made it. He did not make it as difficult as religions have made it. He made it so simple that a child can understand it. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, here in Acts chapter 16, there's a jailer. And verse 30 brought them out, Paul and Silas, verse 30, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the question, isn't it? What do I have to do? I mean, if you tell me, I'll do it. Do I have to join a church to be saved? Do I have to be baptized in, with water baptism to be saved? Do I have to remain faithful to be saved? Do I have to pray through to be saved? Here it is. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. What does it mean to believe on Jesus? It means to rely fully upon him, to depend upon him, to trust upon him and him alone, his finished work on the cross alone for salvation. You know, one of the reasons some people believe they can lose salvation is because they, they have a wrong view of what salvation is. They think, yes, Jesus paid the price, but I have to do my part. I have to add to it with my good works. And then, folks, if you're depending on that, you're not saved. Because salvation is when you depend on Christ and Christ alone as your Savior. Go to John chapter 3. We're going to walk through several passages. If you have come to the place in your life where you realize that you were a sinner, that you realized because of your sin you were lost and headed for hell, and you realize that Jesus Christ was your only hope for salvation, and you've believed on him, you've trusted him, you've depended upon him for your salvation, the Bible says you are born again. You are saved. You are a child of God. And as a child of God, you do not need to fear the torments of hell because Jesus took that penalty for you. I want you to see in John chapter 3, verse 1, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, so this was a religious man, but he was a lost man. Verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water. No, that is not water baptism. That is the birth of the flesh. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Lord, speak to our hearts. If there be someone listening that doesn't know you as Savior, may they trust you today. For every child of God who's here, Lord, I pray you'll just reaffirm to us again how eternally secure we are. In you. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, doesn't matter what your background is, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How long does everlasting? Well, it's forever. If I have something today and lose it next week, was it everlasting? No. Everlasting lasts forever. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So let's take from Scripture what does it take to be saved. Does it take promising God you're never going to sin again? No, because first of all, you have sinned again. So have I. 
Oh, I've turned from all my sins. So you haven't sinned since you've been saved. You haven't sinned since believing on Christ. Listen to me. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Uh, Jesus came to remove our sins, to pay the price for our sins, because we could not pay the price ourselves. Uh, even our righteousness is our filthy rags. So what does it take to be saved? It's simple. Don't add to it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's too simple. God made it simple. It's a free gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've, how many of you have given someone a gift before? When you give somebody a gift, I want to ask you, how many of you gave a gift at Christmas time? And then after you gave them the gift, they opened it up, ooh, ah, you handed them an envelope. And you said, now, here's the payment plan. Uh, you can make your first payment. We'll give you three months' grace. And then after that, we expect regular payments. So that's not a gift at all. Correct. That's not a gift at all. It's not what I want. A gift is free. Somebody paid the full price, and you, by faith, receive it. Salvation is free. Why? Because Jesus did the hard part and paid the price for you completely. And did you know because he paid it all, you can't take any credit for it. He gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. In John 3, look at verse number 36. It says, He that believeth on the Son, that's Jesus, hath, what does that mean? Right now, hath everlasting life. Not will have everlasting life. Not will live forever if you remain faithful unto the end. Hath everlasting life. If I have it and it's everlasting and I could lose it, was it everlasting? No. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Look at John chapter 5, look at verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life right now. Notice, and shall not come into condemnation, but is past, not will pass, is past. You already have passed from death unto life. Did you earn that? No, Jesus earned it for you. Amen. You believed on him. You received that free gift of eternal life. His righteousness was put on your account. Your sins were put on his account. You have right now everlasting life. Look at John chapter 10, verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus writes, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. They didn't earn it, it was given. And they shall never perish. Hold it. If he gave you eternal life, when will you perish? Never. Well, but unless you didn't remain faithful to the end. Folks, let's just scratch it up right now. You haven't remained faithful in and of your flesh. You know who has remained faithful? Jesus Christ in you. You know who has no sin? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And for you to get into heaven, you must be found in Jesus Christ. Having believed on him. Notice... I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You can't get out of God the Son's hand. You can't get out of God the Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You're eternally secure, child of God, in Jesus Christ. Go to Romans chapter 8, please. Look at verse 14. I hope you'll understand how important this is. You know, the Bible says that one of the pieces of the armor of God is the helmet of salvation. Listen, that doesn't just mean you need to be saved, though it does mean that. But it means you need to know that you're saved. You know, if you don't know that you're saved, how much effect are you going to have on the battle for God, in the battlefield for God? Very little. You need to have this settled without a doubt. That once you are secure in Jesus Christ, you're eternally secure. 
I want you to see Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So John 3 says you need to be born again. How can you be born again? By believing on Jesus Christ. Romans 8 says not only are you born again, but you are adopted into the family of God. Well, what's significant about that? Well, I'll just bear with me as I read this. Uh, you can do your own research and verify this, but this, this is amazing. In ancient Rome, adoption had a powerful meaning. When a child was born biologically, the parents had the option of disowning the child for a variety of reasons. The relationship, therefore, was not necessarily desired by the parent nor permanent. Not so, however, with a child who was adopted. In Rome, adopting a child meant that that child was freely chosen by the parents, desired by the parents, and that child would be a permanent part of the family. Don't miss this. Parents could not disown a child they adopted. An adopted child received a new identity. Any prior commitments, responsibilities, and debts were erased. New rights and responsibilities were taken on. Also in Rome, the concept of inheritance was part of life, not something that began at death. Being adopted made someone an heir to their father, joint sharers in all his possessions, and fully united to him. Think about what that means for us as Christians. Rather than diminish the beautiful reality of being children of God through being born again, adoption essentially doubles up on the power and significance of God's fatherhood. It's a constant reminder that we are fully desired, fully loved, that we have taken on a new identity through Jesus, that we are created for heaven, but even right now are heirs, joint heirs with Christ. For this reason, we can cry out, Abba, Father. What's Abba? It's Daddy. Daddy, Father. Look at verse 15. Ye have not received the spirit of, a, of a bondage again to fear. Well, I don't know. Am I still a child of God? You've been adopted. You're in. It's settled. Forever it's settled. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We're not becoming children of God, folks. We are the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you would, please. 2 Corinthians 5.21. You haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Was God going to give me up? He, he's adopted you. It's settled for eternity. You're born again. His DNA is in you. The Holy Spirit of God is in you. But you're adopted. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. That's what he did on that cross. Who knew no sin. Jesus didn't know any sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. Notice the next two words. In him. I'm righteous. Why? Because I'm in Jesus. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, please. Look at verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Stay with me. We'll get out right on time. I promise you, it will be right, out, uh, right on time. Ephesians 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Are you without blame before God? If you're in Jesus, you are. Before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. You're already accepted in the Beloved. You're already accepted. Don't you like being accepted somewhere? Don't you like walking in and being glad people are glad you're there? 
By the way, church family, that's why it's so important when a visitor comes, we go out of our way to say hi to them. It's a new place for them. We've got to go out of our way, let them know we're glad they're here. We have to go out of our way to let them know they're accepted in the beloved. We want them here. When you're a child of God, you're accepted in the beloved. You're in the family. Verse 7, in whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Look at verse 11. In whom? It's in Jesus. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Uh, what, what does that mean? It's a down payment. How many of you ever made a down payment on something? What, what, what did you do? You, you put up some earnest money. That's an old term. What was a down payment? You said, you know what? I, I'm going to be back for the rest. It's like collateral. I'll be back. I'll be back for the rest. When you got saved, you believed on Christ. The Holy Spirit of God immediately took up residency in your heart. That's the earnest notice of the, of the inheritance until, verse 14, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Uh, go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 4. It says, but God who is rich in mercy. What's mercy? It's God not giving us what we deserve. For, he, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. What's grace? It's God giving me favor I don't deserve. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together. Don't miss this. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I am already seated in the heavenlies. Why? I'm in Christ Jesus. Did you hear me? I cannot lose my salvation. If you're a child of God, you're in Christ. You're already seated in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the, what's the next word? It is the what? The gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Any religion, any church that teaches works is, is teaching a false salvation. And if you're depending on your works, you're lost. There, there are two words, do and done. If you trust something you have to do to get you to heaven, you're lost. You need to trust in what Jesus has already done for you. He's already paid for all of your sins on the old rugged cross. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We don't work to get saved, but because we're saved, we should work. Uh, look at Philippians chapter 3. What did Paul say? If you read before Philippians 3, 9, you read Paul, who was a very religious man, who, who, kept, uh, who minded so many different uh, uh, aspects of his religion. In fact, if anybody could brag about how they were righteous as a man, Paul said, well, I could do it. Because I, I kept all these different uh, religious uh, rituals, but those things were nothing. They didn't count for anything before God. What do we need to be saved? Look at Philippians 3, 9. He says, and be found in him. In whom? In Jesus. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. If you stand before God in your own righteousness, you'll be lost to hell forever. You must stand in Jesus' righteousness. Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Look at Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. It says, for ye are dead, that old man, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Old Tim DeVries who deserved death and hell. That's, I'm hid in Christ, with Christ in God. Jesus, when he suffered on the old rugged cross, took my sins, all of them. By the way, how many of my sins were in the future when Jesus died? All of them. How many of your sins were in the future when Jesus died? All of them. And he took my sins, and they were buried with him. And he rose again and conquered sin and death and hell in the grave. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 1.12. 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul writes, 
For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Who is that? Jesus. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What did Paul commit to Jesus? His eternal destiny, his soul. I want you to see Hebrews chapter 10. Did you know if you're saved, you're perfect right now? You're perfect. Say, I'm perfect? I thought you just said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Yeah, you and your flesh, me and my flesh, we're sinful. But in Jesus Christ, we're perfect. Already in the eyes of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. It says, but this man, Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Did you notice forever? How many sacrifices for sin did there have to be? How many? One. For how long? Forever. What does that mean? For every person who's ever lived. Every man, woman, boy, or girl, Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient to cover the price of the sin of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who ever has lived or ever will live. Does that include you? Notice, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting, till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I stand before God perfected. How am I perfected? In Jesus Christ. In Jesus. Notice verse 17, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. If you're saved, it's reserved eternally for you. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God. Why in the world would you go to a church that teaches you the scripture says you better remain faithful or you're going to lose your salvation. Now let me say this. The Holy Spirit of God in you will want you. He'll, he'll, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit in you will want you to work for Jesus and will want you to do what's right. But you don't keep yourself saved. You can't keep yourself saved. We're kept by the power of God. That's how we're kept. Verse 5, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. And we're just scratching the surface. We really are. We're just, I know I'm going through so many verses, but we're just scratching the surface. God's word is very clear that if you are in Jesus Christ, and you're not in Jesus Christ through your works, you're in Jesus Christ by faith, by trusting that what he did on that old rugged cross is enough, and it's the only thing that can save you. If you're in Jesus Christ, believer, you are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. If God, the, the only way you'd be lost is if God the Father kicked out God the Son. That's not going to happen, folks. Because you're in Jesus Christ. He's perfect. He's pure. He's sinless. He's holy. He's righteous. And when you believed on Christ, you were placed in Christ. When God looks at me, He doesn't see me by myself. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees Jesus' blood covering my sins. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Well, it's the sin of presumption to say you know. You know why people say that? Some false religions say that. They say it's a sin because in their minds, you only get to heaven through your deeds. 
through your works, and so therefore it's pride to say, well, I know I'm going to heaven because after all I've earned my place. Folks, when you understand true salvation, you understand it's not pride at all to say, I know I'm going to heaven because it has absolutely nothing to do with my works. And it has everything to do with Jesus' finished work for me. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. The Holy Ghost is our Comforter. What kind of Father would God be if He said, well... You were mine today, you're not tomorrow. Then you're mine the next day, you're not the next day. What kind of savior would Jesus be? He said, I saved your soul from eternal hell. Oh, now I'm throwing you back. Oh, I'm going to save you again. I'm going to throw you back. That's not a savior we need. What kind of comfort would the Holy Ghost be? If I'm accepted in the beloved today, but tomorrow I'm not. And I'm in Jesus Christ today, but tomorrow I'm lost. What kind of comfort would that be, folks? No, no. God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. The Holy Ghost is our Comforter because we have eternal security as a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're relying, depending upon, trusting in, believing upon Jesus Christ alone for your salvation... You are eternally secure in Him. If you're here today and you're relying on anything else, you're lost and you need to be saved. Jesus paid the price for you. Would you humble your heart? Would you call upon Him, trust Him alone for your salvation today? Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. What a wonderful salvation this is. That God would rescue a sinner like me. We deserve death and hell. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't just look at us in our lost condition and ignore us. No, He came to us. He came to this earth. Jesus, the Son of God. He was born and lived a perfect, sinless life. He suffered on an old rugged cross. Every whip lash, every, uh, every beating of the rod and of his, the fists and the crown of thorns in his head, every, every wound, every stripe was for our sins. When he died, he died to pay the price for all the sins of all mankind, of all time. For one sacrifice forever is what he made. And if you're here today and you realize that you are a sinner lost, and you're looking for a means of salvation, I can tell you there's only one. And that's through Jesus Christ. And if you'll humble your heart today and believe on Him, He will save you. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that simple. Who gets all the credit and all the glory? Jesus does, because He did the hard part. He paid the price for our sins. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. And I am concerned about my soul. Please pray for me. I ask you to pray for me. If that's you, would you just quietly lift your hand until I see it? I need to be saved. I am concerned about my soul. Just lift your hand if that's you. Our heads are still bowed. Our eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am saved. Not because I'm a perfect person, but I have a perfect Savior. I am in Jesus Christ. I have believed on Him. I know I'm saved. Now, my sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm adopted. I'm a child of God. If that's you, would you lift your hand? You know you're saved. If you're here or listening later on and you don't know Christ, I want to encourage you. Today, as the music plays, come forward. Someone will take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Child of God, you can't lose your salvation. You are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. And part of the armor of God is putting on the helmet of of salvation. We're, we're about to enter a very important season of winning folks to Christ, of giving out the gospel. Many opportunities we have 
And you need to have it settled deep in your heart to understand as a child of God, you are accepted in the beloved. You are seated in the heavenlies in Christ. You are already forever righteous in God's sight. He has paid the full price. Salvation so simple. Jesus did it all. And you are secure in him. You're secure in him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who is it that you know you need to be a witness to? Who is it you know you need to give this good news to? You know, there's someone that you can, God can use you to reach if you'll make yourself available. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would lift your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, use me. Use me in this next season to win folks to you. Use me to be a witness. If that's you, would you lift your hand to the Lord? Salvation's simple. Jesus paid it all. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth. We can never lose that which you have given to us freely. Eternal life, everlasting life. Thank you so much for salvation, for your plan of salvation. Lord, use us to get that good news to a lost and dying world. We love you in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet, please. We're going to.